Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. Now, you've got uh, a zillion followers on, uh, you're not Kardashian level, but you are, uh, you're, you're highly followed on Twitter and LinkedIn. I, I didn't get a chance to go to Instagram, but, uh, uh, or YouTube, but, you know, we just looked at those two, but you're, you know, you got a lot of people follow you. Why in the world do they follow you? This is just accumulation of people who know you from all of these, you know, all of these years. And, uh, you know, why, why do you think that you're, you're so popular in social media? I think it's my looks. Um, I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> as, as a heavy set, yeah. bald guy in his fifties. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you know, at, at different. It's actually a little. It's a little misleading in that the way I look at it is it's several different audiences because it it because I would see my posts, my follows go up you know, when I'm reporting on the financial crisis or right. I'm, I'm reporting on inflation dynamics. For a while at The New Yorker, I was very much reporting on on Trump's business and had a lot of, I broke some stories there that got a lot of attention. Um, and then, so, but I've noticed like it, like when my book came out, it was actually harder than I thought to use that audience because I don't know how many of them are, you know, I, it, I think, it, I think it's, I think it's overlapping or, or distinct audiences yeah. um, in a lot of cases. I've, I've sort of gotten off Twitter. I just find it, um, it's become quite toxic. I yeah. think, I mean, that's not an original thing to say, but I'm fairly active on LinkedIn and um, where I'm much more just, you know, and and these days my my life is I, I made a decision. So when I moved to Vermont, um, and then my company imploded. Um actually this might be interesting. I mean, I, so when I was running the company with Sony, the idea, and it's a model they've done many times with others, was I Sony gives the money, I give the know-how, we build a company together, and then in about five years, Sony buys it from me. And we would do all these estimates and, and of how big the company would be. And sort of the low end was I would get 10 million. The likely end was I would get 100 million. And it felt like a billion wasn't impossible when we would do our numbers right. based on our theory of what was happening and the growth of the podcast industry. And I sort of had in my head, this is another big mistake. Well, worst case scenario, if all I do is just follow the trend, I'm going to get rich. Like if I don't even beat the trend, I can get rich. And so I sort of in my head was like a guy who's about to be super rich. And my wife was actually upset about it because she's like, Every super rich kid I've ever met is a loser, and right. I don't want our son to be a loser. So she actually didn't wasn't sure she wanted me to get super rich. And then when the company imploded, and there was, um, I mean, I don't want to show off, but I think I made a dollar in the sale of <laughs> of the company back to Sony. Um, the um, and suddenly I'm in Vermont. I've lost this company. And I was like, oh, and I'm not going to be rich. But I was like, well, what, what was I going to do if I was rich? And what I was going to do is there were some writing projects I wanted to do. There were some, some really specific things that I wanted to do with the financial freedom. And I was like, well, why don't I just do that? Why don't I just live as if I'm rich and figure out the money side? And so um, that's mostly worked. I mean, that's pretty much worked since I've been up here is I, I do you know, some consulting and some coaching with business leaders. And then I do, you know, a bunch of cool, fun writing projects, I've worked on some movie projects. So that's sort of my new, what, my new that, way of living. Is that where masterful, you know, you're 
It says you're currently CEO of Masterful Storytelling. Yeah, and so it, I mean, basically, I do two things. I I work with companies on. I mean, it's <laughs> frankly, I needed myself when I was running my company. It, it's it, it's I call it a strategic story. How does a company really nail who they are? What 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 makes them distinct? Um, then who needs to know that they're distinct? And then how do we tell those people? So it's, um, it, it's, it, which can get pretty deep, I find with companies. I mean, I told one story of, I didn't have, you know, my company didn't have a core story because I was going through some, essentially a personal emotional, which is not uncommon. I've met other CEOs. Sometimes you have a, a condition where there's a, difference of opinion at the top leadership and they're not willing to sort it out. And so there's an incoherence of story. Sometimes they have a great story. They just aren't very good at telling it. So they, right. It's very vague or it's very, so that work, I really enjoy that work. And I think, you know, it's something I'm pretty good at. So I've done big projects with like, I did something with Salesforce, something with LinkedIn, something with Apple, but mostly I work with like, I don't know, Ten to a hundred million dollar a year companies, often private equity backed, um, where they're in some kind of transition. They they were just bought by private equity, or they're looking for an exit, or there's a leadership change. And so I find that work really satisfying. And then I also do personal coaching with business leaders on their own. Um, I mean, you you'd be very good at that. Maybe you do that. I don't know. Um, but but it I mean it's not unlike this conversation. It's sort of right. getting them to share um to kind of figure out who am I? What do I stand for? What yeah. do, what do you know? I do find a lot of a lot of men, although women too, especially late forties, fifties, into sixties, there's like a real period of like, I've been on this train and wait, what, what, what do I stand for? What do I believe in? You know, I've just been pursuing career success. So that's really fun. And then I have a bunch of creative projects that are great. I'm working on a book about um, ancient Mesopotamia and it happens to be a fascination of mine. And I'm working with this friend of mine who teaches at Harvard. And so you're going back, you're going back to uh, uh, your trip to, uh, uh, to Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I got to visit a bunch of sites in Iraq and I was like, this is cool. Like, it's this is amazing. where civilization began. It's yeah. amazing how much civilization has been centered there. It's and really it's incredible. Yeah. Degrees and <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's been no air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until maybe some, some recently. It's just like, how did these people live? You know, it's just, yeah. it's not just it Las brutal. Vegas that's hot. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you got a dark. And that country. actually, yeah. that actually is part of the theory of why civilization began there because they needed, they needed these massive irrigation programs. Yeah. They needed right. to, and it, it's even worse than you described because it's hot. It's like no one should live there. It's unbearable. Right. But then, and it doesn't rain almost ever. But when it does rain, it suddenly floods and, yeah. and it destroys <laughs> everything. So, it was these really complicated environmental conditions that forced a kind of partnership that eventually led to cities and states and empires. And well, I'll keep my eye out for that book because it does sound sounds like there's a lot of interesting uh, subject matter there. As you look at companies, and you have looked at companies uh, for a long time, behind the companies are people. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if they're mentally, you know, if they, you know, depending on their experience level, depending on their mental balance, their, you know, uh, it, it all comes back to the leader, doesn't it? It all comes back to the leader. And it's, and, and the, and it is so, I don't mean, you know, people get annoyed when you talk about like, oh, the poor CEO. And I don't mean it that way, but I mean, it, it can be so lonely because, you know, I watched it at my like $5 right. million a year, 25 employee company. I can't imagine what it's like at a much bigger one. Every interaction you have is, is not a real re interaction. You know, the, the 
Right. You know, what, whether it's your employees or your investors or your customers, people are shaping how they talk to you. And you, um, and so, and, and I think, and you have to actively, nobody's coming up to you and saying, hey, you're screwing up. This is bad. Like yeah. my friend even, he kind of hinted at it, but he didn't come out and say it. And because they have some other agenda. And so you have to like, you both have to be a great leader and you have to constantly monitor your leadership and monitor what am I doing wrong? How, how does, what am I missing? And then you have to be a model. You have to, like, you're kind of on stage, but then you also have to be true to yourself if you just fake it completely or just, you know. So I think it's a really, a great leader is sort of a miracle. Um, I think, you know, there's things like Vistage and YPO and EO and um, these groups that I think can be incredibly helpful where you can just meet with peers who don't aren't in your chain of command, but can right. just share their experiences. Your show seems like a really good example of being able to learn from other leaders. But yeah, I think, and I think in a lot of, I think there's probably, I think there's kind of a leadership crisis in corporate America, yeah. in, in, in business right now, as well as politi <laughs> politically, I think. You can actually extend that out. It's like in every area of life, there's a leadership <laughs> Christ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's tricky being a leader because you might think, oh, I got to be, I got to tell everyone what to do. And it, it's, you know, that's not going to work for 26 year olds. But what I did isn't going to work either is, is I'll let them tell me what to do. It's right. how, do, how do I, how do I become better at persuading? How do I become better at guiding, at, at, yeah. at exciting people about a vision? Yeah. And how do I become better at listening to them intelligently? So it's not, you get to do whatever you want, but Here's our big goal. Right. That can't change. But I'm going to really be open to my blind spots. I'm going to be open to fresh ideas, exciting ideas. So it's... Yeah, it's a lot of it has to do with your... Well, part of it, let's just say, when you've got new people and they're bright and this, that, and the other, they're full of themselves, is give them areas where they can... I used to say... <laughs> Get them in a position where they can find out how stupid they really are as fast as yeah. possible. Yeah. So when, yeah. We, so, so when we have a meeting, they'll pay attention. <laughs> yeah, that is a very good point. And and also allowing for failure. Like right. on the list of problems at NPR, it's the most risk averse culture I've ever been a part of. And, you know, they'd rather not try anything yeah. if it means they never have to fail. So you want good failure. You want learning failure. Learning. You want failure that's, that's what we testing learn. the yeah. envelope. But you don't want rampant failure. You don't want just people run around. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, you got to minimize the impact. It's kind of like you can't... You know, you want to give a two-year-old freedom to run around the yard, but you don't want to give him freedom to run around on the street. You know what I'm saying? Right, <laughs> right. There, there right. has to be boundaries. <laughs> right. He doesn't get the AK-47 until yeah. he's four or five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As my as my brother said, as he shot my sister in the ear with his BB gun, and we were driving down the road one day, he said, well, I was aiming at the bird. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can she hear? Yeah. Does that I don't cause think, permanent I don't damage? Think we let him, I don't think we let the six-year-old have the, uh, the the BB gun in the back, <laughs> back seat of the car. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Well, this, I always like to give my uh, – this has been a lot of fun, Adam. Thank you so much. Look forward to talking to you some more down the road to see what kind of adventures you get yourself into. And uh, Yeah, this was a blast. And have Thank some you. fun talking about that. But can you uh, – I, I, I like to offer our, uh, the, the, our guests a chance to have the final word. You know, it's like you, you kind of wonder at the end of talking this much, is there is there anything left to say? But somehow uh, people uh, of accomplishment always have something on their mind that they feel like uh, they can pass on. It will be useful to uh, people coming up and uh, who want to do great things and are, are willing to try. And so what would you say? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what is on my mind these days. It's. Um... I have a buddy, Scott Stern, who teaches entrepreneurship at MIT, and he's a big data guy. And he said, 
When people study what makes a business leader successful, the thing that comes up again and again, the most consistent is that they give time for reflection, time alone with themselves for reflection. And, and that is something I've become increasingly obsessed with in my life and with the life of my clients. When I look back at my life, that you, you're always you're always on some kind of race to something. I mean that, right. and I like that. I want I like yeah. being in races. I right. like having goals. But having some method, whether it's a coach or meditation or church or whatever it is, or a, a friend you can go for long walks on, or go walk going for walks alone, having really honoring and taking that time. And I think an hour a week is probably a minimum of just what do I want? What is working? What is I, I th- yeah. I'm increasingly thinking that is a major, major requirement for both leadership, but also in, in career success, but also just a happy life. Well, you know, uh, I don't know how you, you know, I don't know if you're but most high achievers are have a attention deficit to some degree. I do have ADHD. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is that for people like us, at me anyway, when you tell me just sit and meditate on a chair, it's like, uh, you know, I'm going to go crazy. But what, what saves the day for me is journaling. You know, if I've, yeah, journaling's a fabulous, if yeah. I can write yeah. things down. And then if I have a schedule, you know, I break it down to Monday through Friday, Monday through Sunday, every day, I've got a whole list of things to kind of go through and uh, keeps me on track. But otherwise, I think I would just sitting and staring at the wall. You know, you need to do it. But the the challenge for all of us uh, is to take that insight that you gave and find a way that works for you, the where you can do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not saying any particular yeah. like I right. there are people who do it through through prayer and, and religious, there's people just have a buddy they go biking with and right. they just 90% of what they talk about is just nonsense, but it's just that, that honest moment. I will tell you, I, I have no gain in this. This isn't me selling something, but there is a app called positive intelligence that, um, it, it, um, it's that it's a little pricey, but it, it's, it's this guy who at Stanford, kind of took meditation and and took it into like these two minute little chunks throughout your day that I found really helpful. Cause yes, I, I mean, we could talk about that for days, but I was diagnosed with ADHD pretty old. Cause when I was a kid, it wasn't really a thing. And, 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 and so I do struggle with that. Um, but, but these, you know, an hour a week could be, you know, eight, or whatever it would be, I'm doing the math. It could right. be, um, you know, 32 minute sessions a week. It could right. be, it doesn't have to be right. sitting for an hour at lighting incense and, you know, praying, praying to the gods or something. It could be whatever works for you. Absolutely. That's positive intelligence. Yeah. Positive intelligence. I think it's positive intelligence.org. I found that pretty easily on the or dot com dot com. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Hey Adam, thanks so much. This has been great. And I look forward to uh, talking to you down the road. Thanks for taking the time and a a busy Christmas week. Yeah, thank you. This has been an absolute joy. I really hope we talk again. All right. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealamwinning.com. Thanks for listening.